picked a bad day to sit on the front row. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. I will invite you to get started in your Bibles, finding the book of Obadiah. Uh, if it might be of some help, it is right before the book of Jonah. And it's right after the book of Amos. And because it is only one chapter long, and it is the only book in the Old Testament that is one chapter long, you might need a moment to find it. I know why you have come here this morning. I know what brings you. You come because you love your God and you love what He has to say. And you desire to know it, that you might live it. And because that is why you have come, that is why we take time going slowly and methodically through entire books of the Bible. We just finished Ephesians, and then last week we did another book that is one chapter long, uh, and that is Philemon. Before that, we did all the Beatitudes. Before that, we did the entire book of James, and we will be continuing to do that. But I want to alert you that October is going to be a little strange because both my daughter and my daughter-in-law are extremely pregnant and due, both of them are due on October 5th. One of them in the state of Alabama, one of them in the state of Georgia. So Cindy and I are going to have a lot of fun in October. Uh, it is entirely likely and most probable that there will be at least two Sundays in October when we will not be here. It's possible it could only be one. That's going to depend on what these babies decide to do. And it's really, I'm completely at their mercy. <laughs> but when they go into labor, we are out of here. So uh, that could happen any time. And, and thankfully, Pastor Ed and we have, uh, uh, you know, the Liebrichs are going to be here next week. So uh, we're ready for uh, the uncertainty of it all. So I just ask you to bear with me. I'm hopeful that we'll, I'll certainly be back in time for resur uh, excuse me, Resurrection Sunday. I'll definitely be back in time for Resurrection Sunday. <laughs> <laughs> Reform thank you very much, <laughs> Lisa. Lisa is correct. She's got the prize there. Reformation Sunday. Uh, and uh, we will continue do as we always do in the uh, we've been doing the last couple of years rather uh, we'll look at some of the uh, sola sola statements from the Reformation. But today uh, our attention is Obadiah, and because it's only twenty one verses long, it is one chapter. I would like to read the whole thing, and then we will study it carefully. So I hope you have your Bible. I hope you have the notes on the yellow sheet of paper. Hope you have a pen. I hope you are ready to give this some attention. It begins, the vision of Obadiah, thus says the Lord God concerning Edom. We have heard a report from the Lord, and an envoy has been sent among the nations, saying, Arise and let us go up against her for battle. Behold, I will make you small among the nations. You are greatly despised. The arrogance of your heart has deceived you. You will live, you who live in the clefts of the rock, in the loftiness of your dwelling place, who say in your heart, who will bring me down to earth? Though you build high like the eagle, though you set your nest among the stars, from there I will bring you down, declares the Lord. If thieves came to you, if robbers by night, oh, how you will be ruined. Would they not steal only until they had enough? If grape gatherers came to you, would they not leave some gleanings? Oh, how Esau will be ransacked and his hidden treasure searched out. All the men allied with you will send you forth to the border and the men at peace with you will deceive you and overpower you. They who eat your bread will set an ambush for you. There is no understanding in him. Will I not on that day, declares the Lord, destroy wise men from Edom and understanding from the mountain of Esau? Then your mighty men will be dismayed, O Teman, in order that everyone may be cut off from the mountain of Esau by slaughter. Because of violence to your brother Jacob, you will be covered with shame and you will be cut off forever. On the day that you stood aloof, on the day that strangers carried off his wealth, and foreigners entered his gate and cast lots for Jerusalem, you too were as one of them. 
Do not gloat over your brother's day, the day of his misfortune. And do not rejoice over the sons of Judah in the day of their destruction. Yes, do not boast in the day of their distress. Do not enter the gate of my people in the day of their disaster. Yes, you do not gloat over their calamity in the day of their disaster. And do not loot their wealth in the day of their disaster. And do not stand at the fork of the road to cut down their fugitives. And do not imprison their survivors in the day of their distress. For the day of the Lord draws near on all the nations. As you have done, it will be done to you. Your dealings will return on your own head. Because just as you drank on my holy mountain, all the nations will drink continually. They will drink and swallow and become as if they had never existed. But on Mount Zion, there will be those who escape and it will be holy. And the house of Jacob will possess their possessions. Then the house of Jacob will be a fire and the house of Joseph a flame. But the house of Esau will be as stubble and they will set them on fire and consume them. So there will be no survivor of the house of Esau. The Lord has spoken. Then those of the Negev will possess the mountain of Esau and those of Shephelah, the Philistine plain. Also, they will possess the territory of Ephraim and the territory of Samaria. And Benjamin will possess Gilead and the exiles of this host of the sons of Israel who are among the Canaanites as far as Zarephath and the exiles of Jerusalem who are in Shepharad will possess the cities of the Negev. The deliverers will ascend Mount Zion to judge the mountains of Esau, and the kingdom will be the Lord's. You know, the attributes of God are many. God is pure and God is righteous. God is truth and he is merciful and he is forgiving. He is long suffering and he brings judgment. And he brings his wrath. And he is no less divine when he is judging sin than when he's forgiving it. He is no less God and no less holy when he is showing mercy towards the sinful than when he is punishing the sinful. Of course, we like to think of God as those merciful traits, those forgiving traits. Those long-suffering traits. But that is a very one-dimensional view of God. And therefore, it is incomplete and it does not fully understand God. I think our view of God is, is that when he is forgiving, he has this forgiveness hat that he puts on. And he puts his anger hat aside. And then he shows mercy and kindness. And then when he gets worked up into an anger, he takes off his forgiving and loving hat and puts on his angry hat. That is not the way this works. God is holy. Do you know what that word means? That means at all times, all of his attributes are all working perfectly together. And you see that perfectly in the cross of Christ, don't we? The cross of Christ is simultaneously this wonderful act of mercy and forgiveness on the part of God. And it is also a moment of wrath and judgment. It is both. He is no less God when he is judging than he is when he's forgiving. And I think the book of Obadiah helps us to see why it is so critical that we have a rounded, complete view of God and not a one-dimensional view of God. If you only have a one-dimensional God and all you ever think about is His love and His mercy and His forgiveness, which are wonderful attributes and they bless us mightily, you miss the point that God chastens those whom He loves and He will judge sin. It will not go unpunished. And it is a lie to not present a full picture of God. It's misleading to people not to present a full picture of God. Well, Obadiah allows us to do that. However, as Obadiah, and we're going to talk a moment in a few moments about who this might be, and we'll talk about when this is happening. But first, I just want to start with everything that Obadiah would have assumed you know about the history of Edom. He doesn't give us much about the history of Edom. 
But everybody who would have heard this prophecy when it was written would know very, very well what had transpired from the beginning with regard to Edom and regard to Israel. And so I want to start the story at the beginning. So if you have a way in your Bible to mark Obadiah, we are coming back. But we need to at least know what has transpired between Edom and Israel from the beginning. And it starts in Genesis. Genesis chapter 25. In fact, I'm going to read beginning at verse 21. And I'm going to stop at verse 34. And as I'm reading, I'd like you to think about this question. How would you describe the relationship between these two twin brothers? Because one of them represents the nation of Israel, and one of them represents the nation of Edom. This is the beginning of that relationship. And it starts in Genesis 25, verse 21. And Isaac prayed to the Lord on behalf of his wife because she was barren. And the Lord answered him, and Rebekah, his wife, conceived. But the children, okay, she has twins, but the children struggled together within her. And she said, if it is so, why then am I this way? So she went to inquire of the Lord. And the Lord said to her, two nations are in your womb, and two peoples shall be separated from your body. And one people shall be stronger than the other, and the older shall serve the younger. When her days to be delivered were fulfilled, behold, there were twins in her womb. Now the first came forth red all over like a hairy garment. And they named him Esau, which, by the way, means red. And Edom also means red. And so you can see that Esau's descendants are going to become the nation of Edom. And, of course, his brothers, as we're about, who we're about to meet is going to become the nation of Israel. And afterward, his brother came forth with his hand holding on to Esau's heel. So his name was called Jacob. And Isaac was 60 years old when she gave birth to them. Pray for Jacob. <laughs> I mean, pray for, uh, excuse me, pray for uh, him, because that's, that's quite a thing for Isaac to un undertake. When the boys grew up, Esau became a skillful hunter, a man of the field. But Jacob was a peaceful man living in tents. And we fast forward a little bit in time as these two boys are growing into young men. Verse 20, now Isaac loved Esau because he had a taste for game, but Rebekah loved Jacob. And when Jacob had cooked stew, Esau came, Esau came in from the field and he was famished. And Esau said to Jacob, please let me have a swallow of that red stuff there, for I am famished. Therefore, his name was called Edom. But Jacob said, first, sell me your birthright. So remember, in that culture... You know who rules in a very patriarchal culture? The oldest boy. And who's the oldest boy in this picture? Esau. And Jacob says, oh, you're hungry and I've got some stew? Okay, I need something. Sell me your birthright. 32, and Esau said, behold, I'm about to die. So of what use then is the birthright to me? And Jacob said, first, swear to me as he swore to him and sold his birthright to Jacob. And so, excuse me, and so he swore to him and sold his birthright to Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau bread and lentil stew, and he ate and drank and rose and went on his way. Thus Esau despised his birthright. This is the beginning of the conflict. How would you describe the relationship between these two boys? What words come to mind? What do you think their relationship is like? How did they come out of the womb? Adversarial, right? They are coming out of the womb as adversaries. As they aged, they remained adversaries. Jacob is clearly seeing himself in an adversarial position. And to make matters worse, the parents are egging this on. One is daddy's favorite and one is mom's favorite. And so that is just increasing the enmity between these two boys. And so it continues. 
with their offspring. Offspring. So what is the relationship like between the offspring of the twins? Well, let's go to the book of Numbers, chapter 20, verse 14. What is the relation? So now we're, we're moving way ahead into the days of Moses. And we get a peek at what the relationship is like between the offspring of these two boys. And again, I'd like you to think about what does this relation sound, the relationship sound like? So beginning in chapter 20, verse 14, from Kadesh, Moses then sent messengers to the king of Edom. So there's the two nations, Edom from Esau, Moses from Jacob, from Israel. Thus, your brother Israel has said, you know, all the hardships that have that has befallen us. That our fathers went down to Egypt, and we stayed in Egypt a long time, and the Egyptians treated us and our fathers badly. But when we cried out to the Lord, he heard our voice and sent an angel and brought us out from Egypt. Now behold, we are at Kadesh, a town on the edge of your territory. Please let us pass through your land. We shall not pass through field or through vineyard. We shall not even drink water from a well. We shall go along the king's highway, not turning to the right or the left, until we pass through your territory. Edom, however, said to him, You shall not pass through us, lest I come out with the sword against you. Again, the sons of Israel said to him, We shall go up by the highway, and if I and my livestock do drink any of your water, then I will pay its price. Let me only pass through on my feet, nothing else. But he, this is the king of Edom, said, You shall not pass through. And Edom came out against him with a heavy force and with a strong hand. Thus Edom refused to allow Israel to pass through his territory. So Israel turned away from him. What's the relationship between their children? This is their offspring. This is multiple generations down the road. How would you describe the relationship at this point? Adversarial. It has remained adversarial. These two brothers and their offspring are not getting along. And even when you get reach the time of the kings, I don't know if you know the timeline here, but we're talking with Isaac and the birth of these boys. We're going back 1,900 years. Then we're coming up quite a bit to Moses. Now we're jumping forward even more, another probably a total of 900 years to the time of the kings. You know, this, this takes keeping a grudge to an art form, doesn't it? 2 Kings chapter 8, verse 20 and 22. As you're making your way there, I didn't, in the interest of time, I didn't look at all the fights they had with Saul and all the fights they had with David and all the fights they had with David's general, Joab, and all the fights they had with Solomon. So I'm not even giving you the full picture of the level of animosity that is existing between these two brothers and their offspring. But reach 2 Kings chapter 8, verse 20. And Joram is on the throne in Judah. So this is well even after Solomon's time. How are things going now? Verse 20, in his days, Edom revolted from under the hand of Judah and made a king over themselves. Then Joram crossed over to Zer and all his chariots with him. And it came about that he arose by night and struck the Edomites who had surrounded him and the captains of the chariots. But his army fled to their tents. So Edom revolted against Judah to this day. Then Libna revolted at the same time. What's the relationship like? It is still what? Adversarial. <laughs> yeah, it's an easy word for you to say, right? <laughs> Adversarial. There's still this enmity between the brothers and their offspring, and it shows. Is it showing any signs of abating? Do you see any hint that things are letting up? It, it, in some ways, it seems like it's getting worse. The hatred and the animosity and the headbutting is just worse. So with that in mind, I want to look at some of the other prophets, in addition to Obadiah, who have a few comments to say about our friends, the Edomites, the brother of Israel. Go to Lamentations chapter 4. You'll find that right after Jeremiah, by the way. Both of these books were written by the weeping prophet. 
So I guess it's appropriate that the weeping prophet would have a book called Lamentations. Jeremiah is writing at a very sad time. Very sad time in the history of Israel. The Babylonians have come. By this point in their history, the Assyrians have already taken the tribes of the, north, of the northern kingdom off into um, exile, and they're never coming back. They're never coming back. And now Babylon has shown up and has taken Judah into captivity. Now they are going to come back, but they're going to get some chastening before they come back. And they are weeping. And as it turns out that the Edomites, when this happened, when the Babylonians showed up at the door, that's great news. Because, you know, you know, the enemy of my enemy is my friend, right? They're, they're kind of taking a little pleasure. We're going to see in Obadiah's in Obadiah. We're going to see they're taking a little pleasure in the beatdown that is being received by their brother Israel. And listen to how. Jeremiah describes them. Lamentations chapter 8, excuse me, chapter 4, verse 18. Describing the Edomites, he says, They hunted our steps so that we could not walk in our streets. Our end drew near. Our days were finished, for our end had come. Our pursuers were swifter than the eagles of the sky. They chased us on the mountains. They waited in ambush for us in the wilderness. The breath of our nostrils, the Lord's anointed, was captured in their pits, of whom we had said, under his shadow we shall live among the nations. Yeah, this is a not, not kind words about the Edomites. Ezekiel, who also wrote about the time of the Babylonian captivity. Go to, he's the very next book, by the way. Ezekiel chapter 25. Listen to his assessment of the Edomites. Chapter 25, verses 12, 13, and 14. Thus says the Lord God, because Edom has acted against the house of Judah by taking vengeance and has incurred grievous guilt and avenged themselves upon them. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, I will also stretch out my hand against Edom and cut off man and beast from it. And I will lay it waste from Teman even to Dedan. They will fall by the sword, and I will lay my vengeance on Edom by the hand of my people Israel. Therefore, they will act in Edom according to my anger and according to my wrath. Thus, they will know my vengeance, declares the Lord God. And Jeremiah, in, in his going back a couple of books, he sounds almost like what we just read in Obadiah. In fact, this is so similar to Obadiah. There's a lot of debate about whether Obadiah wrote first or Jeremiah wrote first. You, as, as I read this in, in Jeremiah chapter 49, beginning at verse 7, you say to yourself, well, somebody's borrowing from somebody here. Because this almost sounds exactly what I read to you a few moments ago from Obadiah. Listen to what Jeremiah says concerning Obadiah, verse 7. Thus says the Lord of hosts, is there no longer any wisdom in Teman? Has good counsel been lost to the prudent? Has their wisdom decayed? Flee away, turn back, dwell in the depths, O inhabitants of Dedan, for I will bring the disaster of Esau upon him at the time I punish him. If grape gatherers came to you, would they not leave gleanings? If thieves came by night, they would destroy on, only until they had enough. But I have stripped Esau bare. I have uncovered his hiding places so that he will not be able to conceal himself. His offspring has been destroyed along with his relatives and his neighbors, and he is no more. That almost sounds exactly like Obadiah, doesn't it? One of these guys is definitely borrowing from the other. So are things any better? I mean, if we, if we start with their birth of these two twins, they come out of the womb. In the womb, they're fighting. They come out of the womb fighting. Fast forward 900 years to the time of the exile, and they're still doing what? <laughs> fighting. Well, excuse me, it's much longer than that. It's uh, 1,300 years to the time of the exile with the Babylonians, and they're still doing what? Fighting. It's no love. And by the way, I've given you some, you know, what is the attitude toward Edom generally? 
from Isaiah and Malachi and Amos and Joel, they all, for almost a 300 to 400 year period, are all having the same assessment of Edom. This is Israel's enemy. They take pleasure in being Israel's enemy. In fact, I think it's Ezekiel chapter 35, verse 5, who says, This enmity has been forever. And I believe it's Malachi who says, Thus saith the Lord, Jacob I have loved and Esau I have hated. This is a long, long dispute. And everybody who would have picked up the prophecy of Obadiah or listened to the prophecy of Obadiah would have known this history. And they would have known it well. So with all that in our mind, and I will leave it to you to spend some time reading what is the attitude toward Edom generally, but uh, as a spoiler alert, I can tell you there's just this general enmity between the offspring of these two twins. And it, it, it is, it is deep-seated. So with all that history in mind, let's go back to Obadiah. And I just want to make a few general comments about the first chap, the first verse. Uh, it's the vision of Obadiah. I wish I could tell you who this was. Over a, pan, a span of about 800 years in the Bible, there are no less than 12 men who have this name. The worshiper of Yahweh. So we don't know who this is. Uh, we, which, which is one of the reasons why it's difficult to date. And it's difficult to date this prophecy for another reason. Because the history of Edom and Israel is so contentious and it is so long, it's hard to nail down exactly what was unfolding at the moment that Obadiah is declaring this. And as you can probably imagine, there are several working theories about what the time frame is. But quite frankly, the one that's probably the best, and I use the word probably very, very humbly, the time that's probably the best is all the similarities to the Babylonian exile. And throughout Obadiah's declaring the calamity of Israel he, in Judah, he's declaring the the calamity and he's declaring the, the, the suffering and he's declaring that the, the bad things have happened. And, and the fact that it's almost identical to Jeremiah chapter 49. And we know exactly when Jeremiah wrote, we know exactly what Kings that was. And that is the exile. The only other possibility would be what we read in, in second Kings chapter eight, where they threw off, their shackles for the of, the of Judah, and they put their own king on the throne. Edom did, and they and they uh, actually took joy in some of the other problems that Israel was having with countries like Egypt. The Assyrians had come in in 722 and taken away the northern tribes. So I, I'm I'm being humble about this. It's difficult to peg this down and be precise, but I don't think that affects the lesson here. Whether it was around 586, or whether it was closer to 722, give or take a couple of centuries, this is clearly happening somewhere in that two to 300 year period. And it's happening when something bad has happened to the people of God, the children of Jacob, and Edom is pretty happy about it. It's pretty happy about it. So with all that in mind, I just wanna read through the first nine verses again, and I'd like to just kind of point out a few things about the tone and the mood of this. It is definitely a revelation from God. Thus says the Lord God. By the way, this is probably worth mentioning. That title, the Lord God, you would think that's all over the Bible. You would think, well, everybody uses that title. Actually, there's only two other prophets that use that title for God. One of them was Ezekiel, who was also at the time of the exile. The other, who was a good 150, 200 years before the exile, was Amos, which is the book right before Obadiah, who also uses this title, the Lord God, which is probably why they put it right after Amos, because they said nobody else uses that title. So they put the two guys together that use it the most. 
Thus says the Lord God, we have heard a report from the Lord, it says. This is clearly God speaking. An envoy has been sent among the nations. What is this asking? It's asking for them to go forth in battle. So who's being asked to go to battle? Who's being asked to go to battle here? The nations of the world. And who is their target? Edom. So it's interesting who he's calling to battle. Isn't it interesting he's not calling his own people? Probably because, again, I'm using the word probably very humbly. Probably because they're in exile (laughs) under the thumb of the Babylonians. So he said, yeah, I'm calling the nations to come at you. I'm, I'm, I'm sending forth the call. And then he says this, behold, I will make you small among the nations. You are greatly to be despised. You are greatly to be despised. The arrogance of your heart has deceived you. You who live in the clefts of the rock. You know, they actually lived up in the mountains of the southern Negev. You may not be familiar with the map of Israel, but if you go to the very southern tip of Israel down near the Gulf of Aqaba, where it kind of narrows down into a point like this, that's a pretty rocky region. And the Edomites, that's where they lived. And they liked living there because it, it's safe. Everybody, Even if you're not a military guy, you know what? The high ground wins. And the Edomites go up into the high ground, and not only do they go into the high ground, they go into the high ground in such a way that the only way you can get to them is through narrow gorges. Can you imagine the military advantage of your enemies having to come through a narrow, high-arched gorge? It would be like, quite frankly, not that they had guns, but it'd be like shooting fish in a barrel, wouldn't it? Not a fair fight. So they feel really safe. They feel really safe. And God's saying, yeah, I know where you dwell. I know what you're saying in your heart, he says in verse 3. Who will bring me down to earth? I know you're up there in verse 4. He says, I know you live up there with the eagles. Though you set your nest among the stars, from there I will bring you down, declares the Lord. And then the curses of verse 5 and 6, where he says, listen, even robbers who break into your home can only carry so much stuff, right? He says, I'm taking it all. There'll be nothing left. He said, even the gleaners leave a few grapes behind. He says, I am picking it clean. I'm not leaving a grape. It's like the Grinch who stole Christmas, man. We're leaving nothing behind. We're taking it all. Even thieves leave some stuff behind. Even gleaners leave some stuff behind. He says, I am leaving nothing behind. This is a reference to the promises of the curses and the blessings in Deuteronomy 28. They're pretty straightforward. This is not a complicated formula. This is a real simple formula. Deuteronomy 28, he says, Now it shall be if you will diligently obey the Lord your God, being careful to do all his commandments which I commanded you today, the Lord your God will set you high above all the nations of the earth, and all these blessings shall come upon you and overtake you if you will obey the Lord your God. And then he lists all the wonderful blessings. And then at verse 15, he says this, But it it shall come about if you will not obey the Lord your God to observe to do all his commandments and his statutes, with which I charge you today that all these curses shall come upon you and overtake you. That's a simple formula, isn't it? Obey. Obedience brings God's blessing. Disobedience brings judgment. You say, well, yeah, Lee, but that's, that's Moses talking to Israel. Well, this is Moses talking about all the other nations. Chapter 30, verse 7. And the Lord your God will inflict all these curses on your enemies, that's all the nations around them, and on those who hate you and persecute you. This principle applies to Edom. You obey, and God will bless you. You disobey, and God is coming for you with these curses. First, going back to Obadiah, verse 6. Oh, how Esau will be ransacked, and her hidden treasure searched out. He's using the name Esau on purpose, isn't he? You know what? It's, it's almost as if God has in full view here the whole history. He says, I, I know every single thing that has transpired between the birth of these twins and today. I know it all. 
Nothing has escaped my view. Nothing has escaped my view. And he says, I'm going to ransack even your secret places. My guess is, and, and probably this is a pretty safe guess, the Edomites up there in the mountains had treasure stashed away in caves. And this is God's way of saying, yeah, I even know where your stash is. And I'm coming for it. You don't even get to keep that. You're not clever enough to hide that from me. And then verse 7, he says, your allies are going to turn on you. Your allies are going to turn on you. The men allied with you. And listen, this is really important for the Edomites. When you live up in the mountains, you can't grow a lot of crops. You need a lot of trade. You need people who are probably going to help take care of you. So they're cutting deals with the Egyptians. They're cutting deals with the Assyrians. They're cutting deals with the Babylonians. They are cutting deals with everybody they cut deals with. And this is God saying, you know, all those deals you cut with all these people, they're going to come for you. They're coming for you. There is literally no place you can hide. And there is no one who's going to help you. Verse 8, will I not on that day, declares the Lord, destroy wise men from Edom? You know, one of the, you know what one of the curses is in, De in the Deuteronomy chapter 28? You know what it is? Confusion of mind. Confusion of mind. You can't think straight. He said, I'm going to crush the wisdom of your wise and understanding from the mountain of Esau. And then verse 9, then your mighty men will be dismayed, O Teman. Teman was their largest city. So imagine how this works. Here's what God is saying to you. Your largest city, your, your, the gem in your crown, the place you think is, in, is, is impenetrable. He said, they're going to be afraid, dismayed. Even your toughest city is going to be quaking in front of me in order that everyone may be cut off from the mountain of Esau by slaughter. What's the tone of this? How would you describe the tone of this? Does God sound just a little angry? On a scale of 1 to 10, where is it? Yeah, the 12. <laughs> Somebody said 12. Yeah, you can't miss the intensity of this. I mean, when you're done with verse 9, don't you just want to ask, what did these people do? What in the world did you do to rile God up like this? Well, of course... As we've seen from the history, they have mocked him incessantly for the better part of 1,500 years. Listen, don't doubt God when he says he is slow to anger. Don't doubt God when he says he is merciful and long-suffering and prone to kindness, but he will not strive with men for what? Ever. And 1,500 years into this, this tone is what? I'm, I'm done. We're not talking anymore. I'm done. This is a really intense tone. So what would you describe as the tone? I'll leave it to you to come up with some words, but it's, it's certainly intense and it's certainly angry and it is certainly pointed. What is the justification given for this tone in Obadiah 10 and 11? Well, let me read it for you. Because of violence to your brother Jacob, you will be covered with shame and you will be cut off forever. On the day that you stood aloof, on the day that strangers carried off his wealth and foreigners entered his gate and cast lots for Jerusalem, you too were as one of them. Why is God so angry? What, what is the justification? Listen, it's bad enough when you do evil to strangers. But when you do it to your brother, there seems to be just a level of just despicable. This is just so despicable. You, you, God's saying you did this to your brother. Your twin brother. Who should be the natural object of your affection. When God said that Esau, when he looked at Esau and Jacob and said, it's through Jacob I am going to build my kingdom. It's through Jacob I'm going to build my nation. You know what Esau's response should have been? Glory be to God. Glory be to God that he has chosen a nation to come and give us the truth. And I will serve my brother every way I can. 
because I love the Lord. That's not what Esau's response was, was it? It was jealousy and envy. I'm the oldest. It should have been me. That, that's the response. He's, he, and, and now it is just, it's toxic by the time we get to 586 a, uh, BC. It's toxic in his hatred. He said, yeah, you, you have shown violence towards your brother, the natural object of your affection. And so now, the, uh, beginning in verses 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, it's God's turn to mock. And he says, here's my justification. And so he says, you know what? I've got some warnings for you. So let's talk about these warnings. Verse 12, I just want to start with verse 12. And I want you to think about this question. What is the attitude of Edom being described in verse 12? What is the attitude being described in verse 12? He says to Edom, do not gloat over your brother's day, the day of his misfortune, and do not rejoice over the sons of Judah in the day of their destruction. Yes, do not boast in the day of their distress. There's two things I want you to notice about 12 before you answer the question. Before you answer the question of you know, what is the, the attitude that Edom has, I want you to see there's, there's three things here. Do not gloat. Do not rejoice. Do not boast. There's the three prohibitions. Something else I want you to notice that God says in this day, in this day, in this, this phrase, this little prepositional phrase, on this day, in this day is going to get repeated about nine times in this section. This is very specific. This is in response to a very specific thing Edom has done. There, there's something that's happened. And he says, I am watching you. So what's the attitude of one who gloats and rejoices over the misfortune of someone else? And, not, and to make it even worse, it's the misfortune of your brother. And you're boasting, you're sitting back going, yeah, we're better than you. Look what's happening to you. Those Babylonians are coming. You know, the Babylonians circled the city for two years. It's possible Obadiah was written during that time. And God's just warning them, hey, when the city falls, don't gloat. Don't boast. Don't take joy in their suffering. What kind of attitude is that? How would you, what, what's a word you could use to summarize that? What, what's, what's their problem? What's that? Piety. Piety? Yeah, they feel very self-righteous in this, don't they? Yeah, we're better than, we're better than those children of Israel. Look what's happening to them. God's saying, don't boast. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. You don't have any room to boast. But they're very what? Somebody said something else. What's that? Prideful. They're exceedingly prideful, aren't they? Yeah, we always knew we were better. Didn't we? And now you're getting it right in the neck, and we're going to love every minute of it. And you know what they likely did? Probably what's going on is, well, the Babylonians are laying siege to the city. Judah can't protect the smaller cities. Edom's probably attacking those and looting those cities. And then once the Babylonians had picked over everything in Jerusalem and left, the Edomites probably came in like a vulture on the carcass to see what's left. And just pick. Get, get as much as you can. You know, this is a really prideful attitude. What is the potential danger of such an attitude? Well, verse 3 tells us that they are arrogant. They are arrogant in their heart. And they think they are untouchable. And God is saying to them, you are most definitely not untouchable. Well, look at verses 13 and 14. You know what happens when your heart is wrong? And, and isn't this the story of the Bible? Isn't this really the story of the Bible? When your heart is wrong, when you are arrogant and prideful in your heart, when you have self-righteousness in your heart, where does that lead to really sinful things? Verse 13 and 14. Do not enter the gates. There's another prohibition. Do not enter the gate of my people in the day of their disaster. Yes, do not gloat. He repeats that one. In the day of their disaster, do not loot. So don't go in there and steal stuff. In verse 14, do not stand at the fork of the road and cut down their fugitives and do not imprison their survivors in the day of their distress. You know what they're doing? The people who survived the Babylonian captivity who are retreating from the city, you know what the Edomites are doing? They are picking them off. They're either killing them or they are gathering them up as hostages and going to their new friends, the Babylonians, saying, hey, look what we got for you. 
Look who we caught escaping. Just more for you. God says, this is despicable that you are doing this. It is disgraceful. And if you think I don't see it, you are insane. So what brings forth these bad attitudes? You know, if you have a bad heart, at least bad actions. What would have been a better approach for Edom that might have avoided these sins? What would have been a better way to understand what was going on when the Babylonians surrounded Judah? Fear of God, humility, self-inspection. Wow. If God is doing that to his people, Judah, dear God of heaven, have mercy. What is he going to do to me? But that's not the attitude they have. They're actually enjoying it and trying to profit by it. And it's just disgraceful. Well, so what? So what? Why should you and I care in September of 2022 that these poor Edomites have been a problem for 1,500 years? God decides to judge it. He decides to destroy them. And by the way, if you want to know how the story ends, uh, the Edomites eventually find themselves under the boot of uh, uh, the Edomians, uh, which are in southern Israel. By the way, King Herod the Great, who killed the baby boys in Bethlehem, he was an Edomian. So he, he, they, they find themselves under the boot. And then when the Romans decide to put down the revolt, the, the Edomites decide to join Jerusalem in fighting against the Romans in 70 AD when the temple's destroyed and the general, Roman general Titus just wipes them out. Best estimates are that the Roman general Titus killed a million people in Jerusalem. And they include the Edomites. And they're never heard from in history again. From that, from 70 AD, they don't show up in history ever again. So, who cares? So what? Nice history lesson, Pastor. Thanks for the history lesson. Appreciate you telling us about this. Feel badly for the Edomites that they didn't figure it out. Verse 15. For the day of the Lord draws near on who? All the nations. By the way, that would include ours. Now, all of a sudden, this is not irrelevant. It is relevant to you and me who live in a people who as a body politic, I'm talking about us as a corporate body politic in the United States. You and I live in a body politic that mocks God with his every breath. And there's no way to avoid the reality that God is going to crush that. You cannot just look at what happened to the Edomites and tap your foot in the year 2022 and say they got what they deserved. Those evil, wicked Edomites, they, they deserve to get it in the throat. They deserved it. They had it coming, didn't they? And they did, didn't they? They had earned God's wrath. You and I live in a country that has decided that it is going to mock God at every turn. The list is so long that I will not bore you with it. I would challenge you in this. Can you think of one thing that the body politic in the United States corporately as a culture is doing to honor God? It's a pretty short list. I can't think of anything to put on it. And this, what God has done to the Edomites is what he is going to do to every single nation that mocks him. And we will not escape it. We won't. And then you know what? The, the punishment may be different because I can tell you right now, this punishment he heaped on Edom was it fit the crime, didn't it? He just basically did to them what they're doing to everybody else. And that's what he's going to do to every nation that mocks him. Be it Russia, China, the United States. 
Brazil, Kenya, India. You cannot mock him and escape this judgment. It is coming on all the nations. Verse 16, and when he does deal with us, it's going to be humiliating. It's going to humiliate us. Because just as you drank, and by the word, that word there, if you want to circle it in your Bible, it's really drinking to drunkenness. What's in view here is you got drunk. He said, so let me get this straight. Babylon takes Judah back into exile. They, t- they take almost everything from Babylon. And then you decide to come into the ruins and just drink to excess and get drunk on the suffering of my people. This is drunkenness. And he says, you know what I'm going to do to you? I'm going to make you so drunk. All the nations will drink continually. And they will be so drunk that they will just be as if they never existed. And he's just going to humiliate us. My British history class on Friday, we were watching some of the the stuff from the Queen's um, funeral uh, last Monday. And uh, it was interesting to watch where the American president got seated because it was humiliating. The The American president got seated 14 rows back opposite the royal family away from all the other world leaders, the, the, the ambassador of Poland had a better seat. Do you know why? This is God humiliating. Do you know why? Because he showed up late. And I think the British, who have a real sense of everything running on time, listen, if you've ever been to England, if you have a ticket for the 521 train, you better not show up at 522 because the train's gone. They said, you know what, man? <laughs> You're going to show up late to the Queen's? You know, you get to sit back here. And it was just a humiliation. (sighs) Yeah, you know why this is relevant? Because you and I live in a country that's mocking God at every turn. And disaster is going to befall us. You say, well, pastor, that's a real pick-me-up for today. The truth is not always pleasant. But you know what? There is some really, really good news here. And this is why Obadiah wrote this, by the way. He wrote it to a people who are on the verge of exile or who are going into exile to say, your enemies are going to be punished. Have heart. And you will be victorious. Verses 17 through the end. I'm not going to read all of it. But on Mount Zion, there will be those who escape and it will be holy. And the house of Jacob will possess their possessions. Then the house of Jacob will be a fire. And the house of Joseph, that's that's Israel. That's God's people. There'll be a flame, but the house of Esau will be a stubble and they will set them on fire and consume them so that there will be no survivor of the house of Esau. For the Lord has spoken. And it's going to be, if you you go on and read verse 19, he's going to be north, south, east, and west. This victory is going to be comprehensive for God's people. When we see God's judgment and God's chastening, we are to be comforted by it and to realize that God is God. He is, and he's a rewarder of those who believe in him. And he is a rewarder of those who trust him. And so Obadiah is saying to those who are about to go into exile, don't lose heart. Don't lose faith. God is good to those who love him. And quite frankly, to unbelievers, listen, there's no way to put this nicely. This should be, this should be terrifying. This should frighten you. Because God has seen everything you ever did, everything you have ever said. God knows every thought you have ever thought and every word you have ever spoken. Nothing has escaped his view. And because he is just and holy and kind and merciful and righteous, he is go- that, that sin has to be judged. But praise be to God that he provided the sacrifice in his son, Christ Jesus. And that is what's happening at Calvary. Justice is being done. He is pouring out all of his righteous anger and all of his righteous wrath on the cross so that those who are in Christ are forgiven. And made holy and pure and acceptable to God. I'm not sure that Obadiah is not the most important lesson that not only the United States, but the Western world 
can see today. And I would say that to every world leader. I would say it to our president. I would say it to the president of Russia. I would say it to the leaders in China. I just want you to know God is watching every single thing you're doing. And he is not disinterested. He is not disinterested. And he will judge all the nations just like he judged Edom. So I think we need to pray for a repentant heart. I think we need to pray for a broken heartedness that will forsake our sin and love God more. So let's pray to that end. Let's pray before we head out of here today. Well, Lord, this is a, a sobering message from your prophet Obadiah. And it is, um, it, it just makes us filled with sorrow that we live in a land that has forsaken you and has forgotten you. And it seems to be taking great pleasure in mocking you. Lord, keep us safe from the wiles of the devil. Keep us from the evil one. Keep us a people who are true and contrite and submissive to you. And Lord, when we are not, forgive us, chasten us, and bring us back to the right path. And Lord, it is our prayer that you will show that same kindness to many. That even as we go out and declare a God who is forgiving, but is also pure, as we declare a God who is merciful, but is also wrathful against sin, help us to present the whole picture and to do so in a way that is effective to advancing the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's hard to read Obadiah. It is hard to listen to these words. But we know they are righteous and they are just. And we know that your judgments are perfect and your timing for those judgments is perfect. And so on behalf of our nation, we cry out to you today, turn from your wrath, O Lord. We are definitely not looking forward to the humiliation. And we are not looking forward to the chastening. Be merciful, O Lord, and help us to have feet that are ready to go and share the gospel. Help us to have a voice that is clear and bold and not ashamed of the gospel. An eye that is clear and focused on that which is true in a world full of lies. Help us, O Lord, as we seek to bring glory to your name. And we pray this humbly in Jesus' name. Amen. So before we close this,